This spring, Free Play Arlington is hosting what might be the largest and richest Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Tournament ever. So for this special Game of the Week episode, we're playing Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. At this point, the creation of Street Fighter 2 is the stuff of legend. A strange, often drunk project manager at Capcom, Yoshiki Okamoto, who designed Time Pilot during his time at Konami, was tired of making good, but safe, shoot 'em ups and beat 'em ups. Instead, Okamoto wanted something big, a hit, a world dominating, quarter destroying arcade hit. So he turned to his two best designers, the Akiras. Akira Nishitani and Akira Yasuda were relatively low on the Capcom totem pole when they were handed the reins of the next great Capcom game. So low, in fact, that Capcom insisted that company man Noritaka Funamizu, also affectionately known as Pooh, watch over the project. But by all accounts, Pooh was quickly and permanently relegated to cleaning up the corporate messes made by the two Akiras during what is now considered one of the most insane and strange game development cycles ever. The Akiras, of course, didn't start with a clean slate. In 1987, Capcom had released Street Fighter, an arcade game that notoriously had failed due to its use of pressure-sensitive punch and kick pads rather than buttons. And even though most of the original Street Fighter development team had defected to SNK, Capcom was insistent upon the Akiras that Street Fighter 2 should closely follow and even mimic the events that unfolded in the original Street Fighter arcade game. So with a backdrop of Ryu and Ken from the original Street Fighter, the Akiras reinvented the fighting game genre entirely Focused on making a game that was easy to play but difficult to master, the Akiras designed a simple six-button control scheme with easy-to-perform combos and special moves. The Akiras correctly reasoned that once all of the moves were easy to complete, the players would then begin to focus on each other and not on executing impossible button combinations. With the gameplay mechanics mostly determined, the Akiras paired the mechanics with simple models lifted from the original Street Fighter for a demonstration to the Capcom bosses. Within minutes of playing this extremely rough version of the game, the executives at Capcom withdrew every single spending restriction that had previously been in place for the development of Street Fighter 2. Flush with cash, the Akiras brought in the best animators and sound designers in the Capcom roster to finish the game, which is still considered one of the most artistic and beautiful games ever released. By late 1990, the Akiras had a fully functional game and began the arduous process of playtesting, refining, and balancing what had already become the most expensive game up to that point that Capcom had ever developed. Tense over the expended capital, Capcom announced a worldwide rollout in early 1991, far before the game could be fully and properly tested. But arcades in America were ravenous for the next big thing, and Capcom had more than 10,000 orders just weeks after announcing the game's release. And so, in February 1991, while the game was still in the middle of playtesting, Capcom began shipping what were branded as Street Fighter II The World Warrior arcade units. And the game was a massive, instant success. These arcade cabinets that Capcom charged $2,500 for were bringing in more than $1,000 in quarters a week. This was the first time in history a two-player game saw this level of success. And Capcom could not make Street Fighter II PCBs fast enough. But the game was buggy. Very, very buggy. And while Americans were eating up the game, and most of the American gamers forgave these issues, there was a great cloud of shame that hung over Capcom Japan generally, and the Street Fighter 2 team specifically. Various issues, such as the famous Guile handcuff bug, or the Guile air throw bug, or the Ryu Shuruken hit glitch bug, plagued the game, and greatly hindered the game's attempts to legitimize one versus one competitive arcade games, especially in Japan. So with a buggy hit on its hands, Capcom knew it needed to release a very quick follow-up that addressed the bugs and somehow gave arcade operators a good reason to buy a new game only a year after the release of the first Street Fighter 2. And though Capcom Japan didn't like the idea, 
the brash Capcom USA had it all figured out. Release basically the same game, fix the bugs, make the bosses, Boxer, Claw, Sagat, and Dictator playable, and allow opponents to play against each other with the same character. A design feature that seems obvious now, but had never been seriously considered during the development of Street Fighter II. Dubbing the new release Street Fighter II Champion Edition, Capcom focused this new game on the US market, fearing backlash in Japan for what might appear to be a cash grab rather than giving the game a proper sequel. But this time, Japan ate the game up. While most Japanese players considered World Warrior to be a single player game, there was no doubt that Champion Edition was a competitive masterpiece. Quickly, tournaments popped up all over the world celebrating what was then considered the greatest fighting game of all time. And this is probably a good time to address the strange, sometimes irritating naming issues surrounding three of the boss players featured in World Warrior that then became playable in Champion Edition. In Japan, the boxer character was known as M. Bison, and he looks an awful lot like Mike Tyson, but fearing a last second legal issue in America and not wanting to redo any of the naming sprites, Capcom changed the boxer's name to Balrog in all of the Street Fighter American releases. Now, Balrog was the name of the Claw character in the Japanese release, so Capcom needed a new name for the Claw character in the American releases. And so starts us down a road of terribly confusing naming issues that often arise when discussing Street Fighter 2. So Boxer is Balrog in the American releases, and M. Bison in Japan. Claw is Vega in the American releases, and Balrog in Japan. And Dictator is M. Bison in the American release, and doesn't look a thing like Mike Tyson, by the way, but is Vega in the Japanese releases. In practice, and in the Street Fighter world, these characters are simply referred to as Boxer, Claw, and Dictator. But back to the games. Champion Edition was a massive success, but with these successes arose a serious problem. Since Capcom had issues keeping up with the demand for Street Fighter 2, and arcade operators were having to wait months to receive their cash printing Street Fighter 2 machines, counterfeiters came in to fill the gap. And though counterfeiting is always wrong, sometimes these hackers stumble onto something good. And just as hackers gave birth to Ms. Pac-Man in 1981, so too would hackers play a role in the ongoing development of Street Fighter 2. Champion Edition played great, but there was one major complaint. Once you became proficient at the game, everything felt slow. So after playing around with the CE code, a Taiwanese hacker put together an absolutely insane, unbalanced, ridiculous version of Champion Edition called Rainbow Edition. This hack allowed unlimited fireballs at once, unlimited special moves at once, and all players moved 25% faster. And while Rainbow Edition is a complete mess of a game, it was impossible to go back to the slow speed of Champion Edition after spending any time on the faster, hacked version. So with that in mind, along with a number of minor tweaks that had come up to improve Street Fighter on a tournament level, Capcom went back to work. Before the end of the year, before the end of 1992, only 22 months after releasing Street Fighter II World Warrior, Capcom dropped Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting. Recognizing operator fatigue from the quick re-releases, Capcom released Hyper Fighting both as a full game and as an upgrade to Champion Edition. Hyper Fighting would max out the capabilities of Capcom's PCB technology at the time, pushing what is known as the CPS-1 board to its limits. And, as the name might indicate, the gameplay in Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting was fast. In a rare move that pleased both gamers and operators, the speed increase made for a more pleasant gameplay experience and faster round times, increasing the operator's potential earnings. This version of Street Fighter 2 is still considered by many to be the best popcorn Street Fighter 2 release, as it was extremely easy for an amateur to approach, both against the computer or another player. At Capcom, these quick releases proved relatively boring for the original development team of Street Fighter 2, especially the two Akiras. Though each had some level of involvement in guiding the series forward, both Akiras would move on to other, newer projects and games, handing Street Fighter 2 off to Capcom's staff programmers and developers. And as hyper fighting aged, as always happens, the serious players were able to expose various balance and refinement issues with the game. And in true Capcom fashion, the company was happy to refine the game further, as long as that meant yet another money earning release. After about a year of development, Super Street Fighter 2 was released on the brand new Capcom System 2 or CPS2 board set. It featured across the board updated graphics, along with a slew of new character animations, numerous gameplay tweaks, remastered and tweaked sound effects, a new announcer, and four new characters, T-Hawk, Kami, Fei Long, and DJ. Bizarrely though, and for absolutely no reason, one of the gameplay tweaks was to reduce the speed of the game from hyperfighting, causing mass outrage among arcade players. 
This move, which was largely speculated to be implemented in order to allow the games to run on the less powerful console systems, proved fatal for its arcade lifespan. Immediately, Capcom went into development of what would be the ultimate Street Fighter 2 release, and what just might be the best fighting game of all time, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Taking in the criticisms for Super Street Fighter 2, Capcom balanced the game to near perfection and implemented a speed system that mimicked hyperfighting. The graphics were refreshed, and super combos, air juggles, and throw softening was added. Super Turbo also saw the introduction of the very first secret Street Fighter character, Akuma. If a player beats the single-player version of the game without losing and gets at least three perfect rounds, the player will fight Akuma as the alternate, brutally difficult, final boss. Capcom also introduced Akuma as a secret, selectable character activated at the character select screen. Akuma, however, is so overpowered that he has been completely banned from use from any competitive Super Turbo event. But Super Turbo was the one. The fighting game that basically founded the competitive fighting game world and remains to this day one of the most popular arcade fighters. Over the years, Super Turbo has been a staple of large fighting game tournaments everywhere, like EVO, bringing names like Daigo and Tokido to prominence in the American gaming world. Over the past few years, Super Turbo has seen a massive resurrection in interest across the world. Websites like Super Turbo Revival track all major Super Turbo events and provide a massive resource for what is practically an ancient fighting game at this point. Combine this coverage with the growing barcade and retro arcade movement, and Super Turbo is poised to become the next hot fighting game, more than 20 years after its original release. And Freeplay Arcade is serious about taking a leading role in the Super Turbo renaissance. Having already held two of the richest Super Turbo tournaments ever, Freeplay is gearing up for a massive Super Turbo event during its 2018 Spring Series. With a $5,000 guaranteed prize pool, satellites across the United States, top Japanese players traveling to play in Texas for the first time ever, and two head-to-head -head candy cab setups, this will likely be the biggest and richest Super Turbo tournament of all time. Check out additional details at facebook.com slash freeplayarlington. And in March 2018, bring your A-game. This tournament is going to be loaded with the world's best players. Super Turbo, the most refined fighting game of all time, with Capcom spending years perfecting and balancing its gameplay, is available, and always will be available, at all free play locations. Come play today, practice your Hadoukens and your Shurukens, and maybe come March, you can walk away with part of that massive $5,000 prize pool.